Wednesday of the third week of Lent, and we are continuing our Touchstone series. As I promised on Monday, I'm looking now at the second reading from this previous week's liturgy, the Sunday liturgy. On Monday, I spoke a little about the Hebrew scripture and the traveling through the desert, the constant heat, the constant sort of oppressive atmosphere, and the living water that is not needed once but needed often. This gets developed a little in the second reading, this letter to the Romans, it's the fifth chapter. It is not a continuous reading. When you read it on the, uh, on the little web page that we're giving you with this, you'll notice that it's from chapter five, but it's the first couple verses, one and two, and then it skips to verses five through eight. This is not really uncommon in our Sunday liturgy to have some things pieced together like that. But it asks us to consider the differences between justice and goodness. Now, that's odd for most of us. And I think what we have to understand is justice is one level of goodness, but goodness is a larger concept. It can go much deeper. It's not something that you achieve or don't achieve. It, it really is something that you can always grow in. In, in a really great world, we could say we've achieved justice. But achieving justice would not, would not exhaust the possibilities of goodness. And so I always think of justice as kindergarten, and this kind of goodness that we're going to talk about is probably college level. It is similar in the Gospels, where we have the what people call the golden rule in the first three Gospels, in the synoptic Gospels, uh, it's in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. It's again in the 12th chapter of Mark and the 10th chapter of Luke. In the text, there's nothing says golden rule. It, it actually asks Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus' response is incredibly rabbinic. I think we sometimes forget that Jesus is an English invention. Uh, his name was Joshua. His uh, parents here on earth were Miriam and Yosef, and only through a lot of uh, Eurocentrism and even Anglo-centrism over the years did that get changed to Jesus, whose parents were Mary and Joe. Uh, we kind of whitewashed, literally. We got uh, a lot of the Semitic Middle Eastern flavor out of the story as we reimagined these characters. But we should never forget that this Yoshua was an accepted rabbi. We know this because he's allowed to go into the synagogue and, and read from the scroll and explain the scriptures. And so at least at some level, he's got a following and he is thought to be some sort of rabbi. In, in this moment when they say, what is the great rabbi? What is the greatest commandment? He answers very, as, as I said, so rabbinically. He says, Shema Yisrael Adonai, Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It, he, he lays out the whole prayer, which is called the Shema, the Shema Yisrael. This is out of the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. It is well known. It is prayed like we pray as Christians, the Our Father. It is the go-to prayer. It was actually considered a mitzvah, which is a, a, a religious for some, a religious urging, for others, a religious commandment, uh, depending on where you are in the spectrum of, of, of Judaism. But you prayed it twice a day to fulfill that mitzvah. So you have this prayer that is just readily on the tongue for a rabbi, and then he does something even more in the tradition of rabbis. He says, and the second is like it. This is a way of saying, let me, let me put this into context in modern time to say this is like it. He's saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And that's like this. And his that's like this is love your neighbor as you love yourself. That has sometimes been diminished to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is a little different. Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Both of those fly around in various translations, in various Gospels, but it's a picture of justice. Treat people the way you want to be treated. 
that is essentially a, a sense of fair play. And that is something we should always work at, especially at the level of large systems, of large societies, justice. But John's Gospel goes further. Now, John's Gospel actually goes on to, uh, he doesn't even say the greatest commandment because the greatest commandment already existed. That was part of their tradition. And then he very, in a rabbinical style, he expands upon it. John is, John's Gospel is written by and for Gentiles. It doesn't have that Semitic connection that the others have so strongly. And so John actually says, I give you a new commandment. Not, I'm going to expound on the old one. He gives him something brand new. And he says, love one another as I have loved you. Now that is very different, especially when it's coming from the lips of Jesus. To love others as Jesus loved. There was nothing fair about the way Jesus loved. People treated him badly and he loved anyway. Doesn't sound fair. It does sound like love. Um, wouldn't it be a horrible situation if people didn't know how to move past trying to treat everyone the way they've been treated? Which is different from even the original, which says the way you would like to be treated love others as you would like to be loved. Not necessarily as it actually unfolds. I know people who are engaged that will decide very quickly in their relationship whether they're going to be you know, emotional accountants, keeping a balance of who owes what to whom, and those relationships tend not to last very long. And those who both get great joy at giving to the other. And that becomes the basis to move beyond mere justice. And don't get me wrong, justice must always be the system out of which we work. But we move into mercy, to compassion, to grace, to deeper virtues. And the thing about those virtues is you can never, you can never exhaust the call. The call to justice, theoretically, it won't happen practically, but theoretically, we could finally arrive at a just world. Does that mean we're done? <laughs> Goodness will continue to call us further. So all of us have levels of suffering going on right now. For some, it's isolation. For others, it's huge financial concern. For others, it's health issues. For others, it's life and death. All of us are somewhere different on the spectrum. What we have to decide is whether the suffering that we are experiencing makes us more compassionate or less. People who get too lost in the only fairness and nothing else model, those people will often feel like, well, I, I had to pull myself up from the bootstraps. I suffered coming up through it. They should suffer too. I was hazed as a freshman. They should be hazed as a freshman. That's what happens when justice has nothing else to temper it. Goodness says, I suffered through that, and so I know I wouldn't want anyone else to. That is beyond justice. That is beyond fairness. I will die on the cross for people who are turning against me. That, that, it, it actually, it, it so surpasses the simple ideas of justice. And, and so we're not really called to ever let go of justice. We could spend the rest of our lives just working on that. But know that there's a deeper goal that usually needs to govern our interpersonal reactions. It would be an amazing world if we could systematically depend on justice and individually offer love and mercy and compassion in our daily dealings to do what it takes to alleviate suffering, not because it, it fulfills some idea of righteousness or doing the correct thing or justice or fairness, but because someone's suffering. 
and we know what it is to suffer, and our suffering has taught us compassion. It hasn't given us marks on one side of a ledger or another. I'm so fond of quote, quote, quoting Dorothy Day, who said, I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. I think that is a woman who truly understood that you could spend your whole life growing in mercy and compassion and make no mistake, she was absolutely founded in justice as well. But it was the platform. It was something out of which something larger grew. So here we are at the end of the winter in isolation, rather like a seed in the ground. And we're so used to wondering, why is this happening to us? This doesn't seem fair. And I hope that even though we will always want to pursue justice, especially at the levels of society, at the levels of culture, at the levels of large interaction, I can't help but hope that this spring, as we all come back out into the light at some point, what has germinated in this soil has been mercy and compassion. Notice when you miss people. Notice when you feel scared. Notice when you're uncertain about the future. Notice when you feel sick. And notice in that suffering something that you would work as hard as you needed to to alleviate it anywhere you see it in anyone. That's the mercy of God. That's moving from simple justice, which is a seed, breaking through the ground, but we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know how long we're going to be here germinating. But when we bloom, I hope that that, that new crop, that new harvest, will not simply be just, but will move beyond that to compassion, to mercy, to the goodness of God.